We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. All right, folks, welcome back to the greatest podcast ever. I mean, it's there's also another great one out there um, by Jack Posobiec called Human Events Daily. So, Jack, thanks for being on. We're, we're trying to become the greatest podcast ever. We, we just, we haven't quite, you know, it's like the Constitution, you know, a more perfect, more perfect yeah, podcast. We, we're achieving a perfection, but it's always, it's always a process. You got to tell your listeners to give you five stars. I don't know what that does for you, but um, it just makes me feel good. So I asked my listeners to give me five stars. Well, no, I, I actually had somebody break this down for me. So they were explaining that on, on Apple and Spotify, they actually weight you in terms of your, um, your ranking on the podcast, not necessarily. Mm. So part of it's the part amount of, of stars, yeah. but then part of it's the acceleration by which right. you're receiving reviews as well as downloads. Mm. So they actually rank the reviews higher. So okay. the idea being So there is that, something to, to Yeah, there is actually something. Well, thank you. You, you hear that? Review, yeah. You hear that? You've been listening to my podcast for God knows how long. Uh, there's tens of thousands of you. I know. I see the numbers, but you haven't all given me five stars. So, and- well, this course, is definitely going to be events. definitely going to be a five star podcast. Got to right be. Now. I, I think it Spoiler will. Spoiler alert! I think it will be. Um, Jack, I'm going to I'm going to go into your background just a little okay. bit, uh, and then let, let's get into some recent events. You know, specifically with China. Um, so you you obviously run this podcast now. It's in conjunction with with Turning Point. Uh, that's a daily podcast. Yep. And what are you talking about? Uh, current events? I'm assuming commentary. It is actually you you'd appreciate this um, because it's it's essentially my commander's update brief, right? Yep. So it you know we do it's a short form podcast. Really, you know, I try not to go over 30 minutes mm -hmm. if I can. I pick the top four stories that I think either need some analysis or that nobody's talking about that are on the horizon about to turn into something. And then you're in, you're out, you're done. If you listen to 2X Speed, I'm a big 2X podcast listener in terms of when I listen back. Mm -hmm. So it takes 15 minutes tops. Yeah. I just like listening to chipmunks sing. So that's, you know, the it's same not thing. as bad. It's not, <laughs> honestly, they do it in such a way. The frequency isn't as, uh, doesn't go as completely nuts. So before that, you were also a host for One American News. Uh, you're an officer in the Navy Reserve. You've worked for the Office of Naval Intelligence in uniform and as a civilian. And this is this is a really interesting part of your background. You worked for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, China. I believe you speak Chinese as well. You speak Mandarin. Yeah, there you go. And so you know what? Okay, I saw this and I'm like, how are there not more conspiracy theories about you? I mean, you were because like, <laughs> oh, there's like, plenty. You, you, Don't get me wrong. You know, there's, there's plenty. So many, like it's so easy to start a conspiracy theory about me. Right. You know, like my picture shows up and it's like, oh my god, he's part of the World Economic Forum Great Reset. It's like, no, guys, I'm sorry. Not, but I'm like, how does this not garner ridiculous amount of conspiracies? Yeah, I always thought that, especially because you remember, you know, I really came on the scene in like late 2016, early 2017. And because Russiagate was the sort of, um, you know, how special at the time in terms of Rachel Maddow, they had to sort of just dance around the fact that I had actually spent time in a foreign country and learned a foreign language and, and, you know, lived there for several years, but it wasn't Russia. It was actually China and either yeah. Mandarin. I don't, I, I wasn't speaking Russian or anything to do with Russia. Yeah. And so I've always thought though, that, it, you know, if I'm, you know, Rachel Maddow or one of these, you know, types out there that uh, there's all the whole, I, I love reading them, by the way, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite uh, pastimes is just reading the crazy stuff they came up with is, you know, I would fit much more easily into a China conspiracy theory, but, you know, I haven't really seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. You're not part of the globalist cabal or, or anything after working for the oh <laughs> no I get commerce I Shanghai. get I get I get CIA a lot. I'll oh, get really? like, oh, this yeah. guy, he glows, man. He's, he's a CIA agent, clearly. Yeah. Well, it, it is, it's not a bad cover if you are in the agency, but, you know, we'll move beyond that. We don't, we won't get into that. <laughs> I'm going to recruit you, Congressman. We're going to get you in. Um, so what years were you there? In China. In China. So um, first did a trip there as sort of a study abroad kind of summer th program with the State Department in 06, then um, moved there in 07 and stayed through 08. Okay. So it, it's interesting because you were there, you really got your first glimpse of China, you started learning about China as they were really starting to rise and decide right. that they wanted to be a world power um, at a time when most of the West 
uh, didn't really want to acknowledge that, you know, thought that a peaceful rise of China would be a good thing for everybody. And in theory, that could have been true if they were rising within the kind of the global order that we set about, you know, this this sort of American led order. But they don't, of course, that's not what their right. values are. So this are. is, you know, I was there at the time when they were, I mean, first visit, they had only been in the WTO for five years, right? Mm -hmm. So they had just gotten into World Trade Organization that that balance of trading partners hadn't really been completely flipped the way it is now. The U.S. still was a major player on the world stage in terms of global trade. Now, obviously, that in, from when I first was there to now is completely inverted. Yeah. Right? They are the major, the world's major trading partner for you know even in our own backyard here in in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, for almost everybody, with the exception of a few countries like, like Canada, which of course is adjacent to the United States, so right. it makes sense to be a trading partner, Mexico, and. It was a time where, what, and, and funny enough is when I was in Shanghai, and that's, that's the city I lived in, and uh, so I was working uh, to stint at the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, Xi Jinping was the Shanghai city chief for the party there. So he had Dug yet to there. even ascend. Well, it's, it's, it's not, an, so they have, they have a dual track system, right? So they have their, you know, they have the, their party boss for the, for a municipal area, and then they'll have their sort of official side mayor, but everybody knows who's in, you know, who's the one with the real power. It's the one, it's yeah. party, party boss. So I actually got to just briefly run into him once in 2008 in Shanghai at this world expo event. And um, everybody knew at the time that he was going up. I mean, we did not realize that how up he would eventually make it and how fast. But, you know, fast forward, here we are 14 years later. And later this year, he's about to be named essentially party chairman for life, which we haven't seen in the CCP since literally since Chairman Mao. Yeah, it's concerning. I want to read a quote um, that is a, a 1999 to PLA, uh, which is the Chinese Army, People's Liberation Army. Two colonels published a book called Unrestricted Warfare. Yes. It could also be uh, translated as War Beyond Rules. And the premise, according to one of the authors, is, quote, strong countries make the rules while rising ones break them and exploit loopholes. But the United States has to observe its own rules or the whole world will not trust it. And I, it really encapsulates the dilemma that we have when, when dealing with the Chinese. Because, you know, a lot of people in our own country say, look, you got to play by their rules. you got to hit them hard. Well, it, Fine, but you're you're getting you're in a sense you're giving them exactly what they want, which is to undermine the institutions that you have set about that benefit you in the first place, and so it leaves us in this difficult situation. I mean, the military competition, the military buildup is similar. We build our military to be a a world superpower. They build their military to screw with us <laughs> and, and for for area access and 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 and, and, and area denial. Area denial, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it's they're in an easier position perpetually. It seems. Well, they will be because, you know, since really the post-Cold War era, you know, we had this idea and certainly here in this town that it was the end of history and that the United mm -hmm. States would be the global hegemon forever and that all we need to do is go around and defeat these last few remaining autocratic regimes, bring everyone right. into the fold, break up, you know, Yugoslavia, do something with Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, that, you know, and then, and then we will just have Pax Americana, right? And that was, that was sort of the idea. And China, we thought, right, was on our side because we had exploited under right. Kissinger, the Sino-Soviet split. In, in, in our Western minds, we think it, we, we think that they understand right. that it benefits them to just play by these rules is what, you know, but, it, but they don't see it that way. No, they don't see it that way at all. And, the real inflection point in terms of all of this, and I think everyone understands, um, at least if you're listening in the United States or anywhere in the West, that it was Tiananmen Square. And so Tiananmen Square came the big, uh, and this was the difference, right? Because in the Soviet Union, um, Russian soldiers, of course, famously refused to fire on their own civilians. Uh, Beijing, not so much, right? So you do have this regime that looked at the collapse of the Soviet Union, understood what happened there, studied it in great detail and has taken steps to just sort of leapfrog in front of all of this and taken that Western idea that economic liberalization will lead to political liberalization and just kind of turned it on its head. And they said, well, we don't think we have to do this. And they're pursuing this dual track path and it seems to be working for them very well. It's just, does it seem like there's something we just don't understand about Chinese culture um, and, and, and specifically the valuation of individual liberty? You know, it's almost, I, I may, maybe for too long, the West and Americans in particular just assumed we operated under this assumption right. that individual liberty was actually a thing. Like we actually care about it. Right, right, and of right. course, because we, we take it for granted. Late, lately, that's been in dispute with COVID restrictions and I, whatnot. But I do think that... Yeah, Canada's that, finding that out right now. 
Yeah. Um, but that being said, I do think that individual liberty as a cultural value has clearly won out. I think the backlash is is very clear. Um, Democrats are, you know, trying to like, you, well, in, you can in see the, them in starting the West. to claim. In, in the West. In our country. Yes. Yeah, specifically in the U.S. I think Europe still has some ways to go and Canada Australia. does as well. <laughs> Australia's yeah. doing pretty bad. But I'm um, just talking about the U.S. Of course. Um, it does seem that individual liberty has won out, but there was this assumption that Every, that other cultures should also believe that. And are we just getting that wrong about Chinese culture? You spent years there. I mean, that's, that's never been, that. so that's never been a, um, a, a cultural value in China. It confu- even if you go back to pre-communism, Confucianism is hierarchical. Um, if you read any Chinese literature, the four great classics, if you re- if you pay attention, even, even Chinese movies that come out now, um, I always refer to the, um, you know, I, I like to use pop culture, you know, um, as a way, cause that's, that's how we carry on our, yeah. our ideas. Right. Um, and so in, in China, they have this movie with Jet Li called Hero. And it's it's sort of like the Chinese Star Wars in some ways yeah. because it's it's the Empire and the Rebels, right? Yeah. Just at least that that dynamic. Jelly is pretty cool. You know, he is cool. I've, I've met him actually. Um, I'm, when I was over there, he and, took apart um, that gun in Lethal Weapon Four. He really like, did. How Just the hell boom, did you do done. that? I mean, and no um, flat on his face. <laughs> he so in that film, right? So he's the lead, he's with the Rebels, and he's like their great fighter, mm-hmm. and then they're fighting against the Empire, and this is like. Um, I forget which dynasty it was. I think it was Tang Dynasty. And, you know, then they flee to the desert. And then eventually they make their way all the way up to the Imperial capital. And it's like that final scene. So in, in Star Wars, you'd have, you know, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader versus the Emperor. Well, in this one, it's Jet Li and his friends versus the Emperor. But the Emperor goes to Jet Li's character in the Chinese version. And this, and it's, you know, I, I say version. It's not sci-fi. It's, it's historical yeah. Chinese drama, uh, action film. And the Emperor says, don't you understand the stability of the Empire is better for everyone. And so if the empire is stable, the country is stable, the people will be more prosperous, the people will be more cohesive, and our country will be united. This is the way forward. That's what I've been trying to do. And Jet Li's character hears that, internalizes it, and then instead of fighting the emperor, he turns and kills his friends. What? And then and this is the end. The that's, end of the that's movie. That's not how the American version and the movie's would called. Go. It's called Hero, right? And so he goes. This would yeah. be like he succumbs to the party. Yeah, this would be like mm-hmm. Skywalker saying, "Oh, right, the Emperor is right about all this. I should join the Empire." This, and I guess, is you know, if you if you watch the prequels, that's kind of what what um, how Darth Vader comes about. Yeah. But um, it's this idea that they place national stability, national cohesion ahead of the interests of everything. And so a complete subversion of, as what you were just saying, the idea of individual liberty being rested on the, the power of the individual, um, they don't look at it that way. They've never looked at it that way in their pop culture, in their history. They never drive for that. Now, um, one thing that is interesting is that instead of you know moving towards this idea, so you're seeing a switch now in the party because at one point it was always that the party represented China, right? But now they've added a new wrinkle and that wrinkle is Xi Jinping. So the party represents the Chinese people and Xi Jinping represents the party. So if you want that full cohesion, you're hearing this word again and again and again throughout China, even even in party internal doctrine, uh, cohesion, 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 which is essentially a me, you know, a, a message to the other party members, the internal factions. Jiang Zemin yeah. was kind of leading this sort of uh, anti-Xi faction that's been just completely decimated, absolutely purged. Um, they don't have the struggle sessions in stadiums anymore like they did during the Cultural Revolution. They have them on live TV every single night that you sit home. It's actually the number one show in China for the last five years is um, these these officials who get arrested and then they go on TV and they admit their crimes and self-incriminate. Really? Oh, yeah. That is oh, so yeah. Dystopian. It's kind of like... 1984 it's, it's craziness. It's sort of like House of Cards, but real. And it's like House of Cards meets a reality show. Yeah. And But these guys are actually getting purged, arrested, to include uh, Joe Yokong, even early on, who was, I mean, ac- we're talking an actual mem- member of the Politburo at one point, that she just wiped him out very early on. And so uh, this has been the new wrinkle. So you're really seeing that, you know, pe- people like to say that Putin sees himself as the new czar, then you really have to ask, does she him- see himself as the new emperor of China? Clearly. I mean, the, I, a lot of us would answer that very clearly, yes. I mean, um, you, you said something in a recent Newsweek article, which um, I thought was interesting. You said between the 2008 games, which you, which you wrote was China's coming out ceremony, but the current games 
are Xi Jinping's coronation ceremonies. What do you mean by that? Well, so when I wrote that piece in Newsweek, and, and Josh Hammer over there has been great, and I, I really thank him for, for publishing it. it I go around D.C., and I, I hear people talk about China and the CCP, and they say, oh, they're, you know, just, they're just about to collapse. They're teetering on the brink. It's five, ten more years. They're done, you know, and this one, Evergrande, is going to be it, and that's the contagion that will spread. And, and I kind of turn around, and I say... Xi Jinping's run the table. I think he's run the table when it comes to the various factions. I think he's run the, clearly run the table on COVID. If there was ever anything that actually would speak yeah. to a regime uh, hindrance or, you know, I mean, they studied Chernobyl, right? They understood right. what Chernobyl meant for the Russian Communist Party. And they were able to use their leverage on those international intu- institutions that you just spoke about to essentially whitewash their role in these gain-of-function experiments, et cetera, and, and certainly in their role. And even if you don't want to talk about the gain-of-function, you can certainly yeah. say that they encouraged the spread or, or downplayed they, they the spread. It, they hit it. They disappeared doctors. They personally lied about human international human. International travel, but stopped domestic travel. Yeah, you can still find their, their demarches where they were going to the uh, Italian government demanding that the government of Italy, even as the coffins are piling up yeah. in churches in Northern Italy, demanding that they continue to take Chinese travelers right. in. And we and reward so, them with the Olympics. And we the reward Winter them Olympics. With the Olympics. Just, so, just so we can have a, a, a crappy ski jump in the middle of some dystopian communist landscape. <laughs> people didn't believe me when I posted that picture. <laughs> you know, I, people I were looking at that. They said, they said, that can't be real. That's no Poso's doing, uh, you know, yeah. Photoshop again. That's a meme. Yeah. And, I, and then I, I posted, so I went on to... Um, I think Getty Images and Reuters and a few others and found like yeah. 20 more pictures and posted them. That's, that's real. That's, and it's, it's such a joke to take our teams. And you see the skiers are taking, you know, it's group smoggy, photos. It's ugly. It's it was, I mean, I don't know. Like, if, you know, um, we have the Rockies here. Yeah, yeah, right. They have the Alps in Europe. I mean, there's nice places. It, to they do actually the call it Olympics. the Alpine skiing. Right? Yeah, it's right. Because right? it's, 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 it's meant to be the Alps, right? Yeah. Like, I just, I don't even understand how they, how we even decided upon I don't know how the Olympic Committee works, but decided upon China in the first place. Well, I think it's, it's it seven years it prior. COVID. But what's interesting to me is that, do you know which country was uh, came down to the final two in 2014 for this one between uh, or China? It was either China or Kazakhstan. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Why are these our choices? <laughs> this makes this is this is absurd. Uh, yeah, if if only mean, the God Athenians sakes. could come forward and uh, and see, yeah, you know, just, what the games have become I since mean, then. Come on, I don't, I've never been to China. Uh, I believe I'm. I believe I'm not allowed to go uh, because I introduced a bill that would allow Americans to band together and uh, take on China a class action lawsuit for damages from COVID because of their hiding of the pandemic. And after that, I believe they sanctioned me. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but uh, I don't think I can go. So I've never been. Is Beijing... I mean, are there at least nice parts to it? Like, where where is that crazy looking no, ski jump? No, it's just a no. big ugly city. No, most of Beijing looks like that. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that's keep in mind that's after the the images you're seeing now are after they've uh, forced all the coal plants and the um, that's actually a coal plant that you're seeing next to it. So it's they, they, they use it the looks. they use the cooling tower. So a lot of Americans would associate that with um, with nuclear power. Yeah. But when you see that that single smokes effect next to it, no, that's that's a coal plant. With um, with cooling towers, they use forced uh, some emissions control, um, but they've turned the factories off. They turned the smokestacks off for about uh, a month prior to the games, and so they, of course that's going to hurt their economic output. But they realize that because they want to get try to get some photos of at least a little bit of a blue sky. But um, I do remember I, the one story I tell about Beijing. So the first time I went there is I remember being in the '90s, right. Um, when I was in school, acid rain was this big mm-hmm. topic. They kept telling that. you acid rain. Yeah. And I, I had this girl in my classroom. Rain, all like freak out. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I had this girl in my class who she would wear her galoshes and raincoat every single day, regardless of weather, just in case, right? Because we, the they were told rain. the acid rain. And we used to think that there were just clouds. The yeah. same way they used to think quicksand was just like, you know, on your way home, watch out for cl- yeah. quicksand. That right? was a weird 90s myth. It was That's just true. this weird. Yeah, yeah, I used I to, when I, growing I up, I used to think that, that that would play, that quicksand would play a much larger part of my life yeah. than uh, than it actually like has. Like if sand just gets wet, it turns into quicksand. I mean, right, that, like, yeah, that, 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 was, that was the contention. It's just gone, right? So... But when I got to Beijing, that actually was the very first time that I ever actually experienced acid rain in my oh, life. I thought you were going to say um, quicksand. That that would... that, well, actually, yeah, funny enough, there is a desertification going on outside mm. of Beijing. So if you go towards um, really the western parts of Beijing or if you head towards where the uh, 
up north or in the, towards where the Great Wall is, you, you wouldn't find desert very quickly, actually. And that's also because of pollution. But when the acid rain well, hit... completely annihilating their yeah. lakes and rivers for mining operations. Oh, I yeah. Mean, this gets to a whole different conversation about where we should do mining for rare earth minerals instead of importing it from China, where they're just destroying the environment. Um, anyway, but... Right, yeah. If, you, if you're someone who actually... Like, if you're a Greta Thunberg out there and you're worried about, you know, climate, hey, hey, I've got to <laughs> you know, tell you all about China. Right. Um, that... I remember I was wearing a white t-shirt and of course I want to go see Tiananmen Square the night I get there because of course, right? Tiananmen Square, Beijing. So I go out, acid rain hits and just destroyed the the, the shirt I was wearing. Just what? utterly destroyed it. How did it feel? Like um, like a heavy rain um, and, and just, just profoundly dirty. So you, you know the old yeah. sort of saying about... What do you mean by destroyed? Like it melted off of you or just no, got not, dirty? not melted, okay. but, you know, certainly felt like it had a chemical composition to it so that my shirt became almost like like hard right yeah. when you like when you when you use like a cheap uh, detergent or something yeah. and then and just brown and nasty so is, is that still ongoing i mean have they cleaned it they it, cleaned it up has their, gotten their better it bit, has right? gotten better since 2006 um that's one thing that you know i you know I'd be lying if I said they hadn't made strides to it, but that's really, that's not because of the West. That's because people internally were saying, Hey, we're just dying. We we, we can't live here. We we cannot live through this. I remember I had a friend, um, even from Shanghai, which isn't as bad as Beijing. And, uh, when they came to the U S, um, this is someone who had been a teacher at the school that I went to and they came, had psoriasis, um, all their whole life and took medicine for it, you know, monthly comes to the U S gone in a month, just crazy, completely gone skin, totally cleared up just, you know, totally normal. And I remember the one thing that he said, um, coming to the U.S. and seeing suburbs, right? Because suburbs is not something that really exists in China unless you are uh, fabulously wealthy, right? This yeah. is like the rich of the rich. Or do people, they just live in apartment buildings. Apartments, stacked yeah. up oh, on yeah. top of each other. Yep, yeah. 100%. And said, wow, I didn't realize that people and trees could live together like this. People and trees? Right, so that the idea that, you know, like a yeah. le- like your class, I'm from Pennsylvania, yeah. so like a classic yeah. leafy suburb. Yeah. That, that yeah. you know, we would con- we consider, trees. right? You know, but, um, and so that's, you know, I think of pollution in that perspective and then I come back to the U.S. and I hear, you know, the green movement, I say, well, you know, I, I, I hear you're coming from on pollution, but you know, we, we have no clue what it's like. If you haven't been there and seen this level of pollution and the smog of, you know, a, a, a nice day in Shanghai is like, you know, a, a post-apocalyptic orange, you know, the yeah. sky. Um, I, it's, my last you know, it was just in- not... Not in nice. Korea, and mm-hmm. it was the, the smog there was horrendous. Korea is but, yeah, but what Seoul? Not, yeah, yeah. It wasn't Seoul. because of Korea. It was because the, the it was the winds were actually taking the smog from China. Right, because you're right across over. the Gulf. Right. Yeah, no. Um, Seoul is not Busan is nicer. Um, in terms of that, um, the, the sky is nicer, and and all the way on the southern coast, um, where the navy base is there. But but Seoul, yeah, no, it's it's not very nice. Yeah, but not no, not at all. But it's because of China, I guess is the, is the point I'm making. It's it's just that bad in China. Um, or at least that's what the Koreans told me. They don't have a ton of heavy industry, so I, you know, I don't, I don't have any reason not to believe that. Um, but you know, back to the um, back to the to the Olympics and the, and the coronation ceremony. I guess. I mean, but my my point, and this this is everything we're talking about goes goes back to my point though, is that this is Xi Jinping basically saying, "Look, I, I can make you ski in the middle of an industrial park, and you'll do it." And you won't say anything about it. The athletes, of course, you know, Speaker Pelosi has told, has instructed them, yeah. you're not allowed to speak out about this while you're over there, which, and, you know, to her credit, I mean, she's not wrong about that, right? You know? Yeah, it's like you could, if, you, if you're being kind to her, you could say, well, she's just saying, hey, like, just, it's not worth it because they might disappear you. Now, right. I don't, I don't, I don't think, but that, at the I same think time, that's an empty threat. I don't think they will. I think, I think there's something... Athletes. I, I just think there's something kind of un-American about yeah, that. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that she's un-American, but just that that thought that, you know, you're going to go into a regime like that and uh, be in the heart of it, right. knowing that Xi Jinping is right there. Like, where's the Jesse Owens 1936 moment, you know, of, you know, we're the Americans, we stand for something, we stand for something bigger than us, and we're willing to put everything on the line. That's what I thought the United States of America Did you see about. the ad, um, uh, Congressman Mike Waltz, uh, in, in, in conjunction with, uh, who's the... Huh? In, in S. Kander, right. um, they did an ad and they got it actually up on during the Olympics on NBC. That was just they called it the Genocide Olympics, just called out all the 
uh, the woke corporations uh, supporting the Olympics. You know, meanwhile they're boycotting Georgia because you know we can't do drop boxes at three a.m. or whatever the whatever the right, contention right. is. Um, you know, so that's good to see. I think there is some kind of backlash. I don't know why the Democrat Party at large doesn't take this on easy. I mean, because it's the easiest political move in the world for Pelosi to say, hey, go athletes, just to stand up to those authoritarians. They're not going to disappear our well, and, and she used to be, right? When she was first elected in, in 87, believe it or not, uh, or I guess she's 86 and then gets to Congress in 87, uh, she was com- incredibly outspoken on Tibet. And, you know, representing, um, I believe at the time, I'd have to look at her district now, but at the time she had the Shanghai, China, or, uh, uh, San Francisco Chinatown, mm-hmm in her district. And that was, again, those early Chinatowns. So like San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, DC, to an extent, DC, China, it's not that big, but um, that was people who had fled communism. And so her constituents were extremely anti-Beijing. And then at the time, of course, Tibet was this, this massive left-wing cause that everybody was for, you know, Brad Pitt makes a movie about it in the nineties, gets banned. I think they let him back though. Um, so there may be hope for you, Congressman, yeah. um, that you just have to make some more positive movies about China. Yeah, you'll be good, make you'll, positive, you'll, you'll, you'll be good to go. You'll be good to go. Um, and um, I'll, I'll try sneaky in or something. <laughs> and um, but you 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 have this situation where over time, and you know, you really do look at the way that U.S. business and U.S. trade has increased with China. The Democrat Party has kind of sought at first it was a softening on these issues and then it's just a complete like Hillary Clinton Hillary Clinton when she was first lady Clinton is uh, famous for going to Beijing and speaking out about women's rights right this was seen as a a milestone of the feminist movement it was something that she talked about a lot when she ran for senate in New York and just complete silence yeah i mean it, you know it kind of begs the question so so this this week we um uh, the House passed the Competes Act. Um, most Republicans, if not all Republicans, uh, voted against it. Uh, now, but but it is a Democrat attempt to you know compete with China, to to outmaneuver China, to outindustrialize policy China. Um, and there has been you know some um, you know some talk of that on the right uh, to to an extent. I, I think I think it's more of a kind of a cultural awakening like look we need to compete with china and we need to figure that out right. um completely libertarian trade economics won't work with china I, th- I think that's more the realization on the right i don't think that necessarily translates into policy that says let's just have grants for corporations that um so that they can build supply chains because like, i'm not sure when well, this that has means. been what's what's interesting that did you bring that up is because in in as I said before, in, in China, they have a whole of society approach to all of these things. So f- for them to subsidize industry, to pursue a mercantilist policy versus, uh, you know, free trade, you know, kind of Milton Friedman sort of approach, um, that's, that's inherent in, in their way of thinking. They would think, why wouldn't we subsidize these things? Whereas in the United States, you know, we do come from more of a free trade, free enterprise, free market um, tradition. And so the idea, we, we don't even have departments, you know, in the United States government to to run that sort of thing. And we certainly have uh, tax carve outs here and there for various things, but nothing on the scale of of what the PRC is able to bring to bear. And it's just not something that's that's been in our tradition and ever has been. No, and it, and it begs the question, I mean, should we even try? And uh, I, I, I think most of us land on the answer is no, because you just can't out subsidize what they're going to subsidize. They'll just they'll just keep going up to a point where, you know, we just can't we can't keep going up that ladder. And so the question is, what do we, what do we do? Um, because there is an interest too in still having our businesses be allowed market access to them. One of the, um, one of the most interesting things that I've, I've been able to note in all of this lately is, is and I've become, and I really, I really focus on Xi Jinping. I really watch what he says. When he went and spoke um, at the World Economic Forum, you know, your, your handlers, your leaders. <laughs> yeah, my your, handlers, oh, I'm gonna um, call them right now. Um, <laughs> and the, this, he delivered a speech about, um, you know, you know, talking about responsible leadership and cooperation. Of course, he's going to say all those things. And there was an interesting moment, though, where he made a not so veiled reference to um, interest rates in the United States. Mm-hmm. And he said, I don't want he essentially was saying, I don't want to see the Fed raising interest rates. Which I think everybody on the street knows is, is, is coming. It's, mm-hmm. it's probably coming. It's just been. You know, the money printer's been going on for too long. Rates have been essentially negative, you know, vis-a-vis inflation's out of control. So you got to do something, right? And he was kind of warning 
it really, I mean, directly speaking out on this policy, I was saying, I don't want this to happen with, you know, global partners. And that struck me as interesting because we know, look, Ray Dalio at Bridgewater's talked about this. Larry Fink at BlackRock has talked about this. They still, BlackRock is triple down, tripling down on their China investment. They're encouraging more investment in China. Uh, Ray Dalio has said from Bridgewater that he views the next century as the Chinese century. And he said, look, it's a fait accompli. So either you're on board and you can make money or, you know, you stand off the side and, and just let them win. Um, but I noticed that when Xi Jinping talked about the financial side of it. You know, this was one of the few times you really see him actually talk about any specific policy. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that he real and, and we look at China, right? Y you got to understand that it's 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 multiple regions so that the east the east coast of China is almost a country unto itself and sort of the inner is, is your middle tier and then the western uh, uh, recesses all the way out to Tibet and Xinjiang are, are very economically depressed compared to their, I mean, you're talking about things on the scale of like Yemen, right, yeah. in, in Western China versus the East, which would be, you know, if you considered a country on its own, it would probably be on par with, with like, yeah, like, like South Korea or Japan. Mm -hmm. And so they know that, she knows that, but the only way you can get this off, this is why he's basically stuck with, with essentially, you know, that communist idea of, well, we've got to subsidize the people out there, so we have to redistribute something or else they're going to rise up against us. And so he's been doing that, but at the same time, he's been able to do that because he has this massive influx of foreign direct investment and capital from the United States, which he knows is able to, they, that BlackRock and, and uh, these other corporations are able to do, money market firms are able to do because they, interest yeah. rates being where they are. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting kind of seeing that whole chain lead up to Xi Jinping actually mentioning it as a, you know, again, when he's meeting with your friends at the World Economic Forum. And, and what are the, you know, Steelman, the, the, the argument, you said you have this discussion with, you know, people in the Beltway that said, look, China's going to collapse at some point. I mean, they have some reasons for saying that, you know, poor investments, um, you know, I think uh, alienating more and more allies around the world, you know, because it, you know, even, even poor nations that have been taken advantage of by their sort of, um, you know, predatory loan practices, you right. know, eventually that, that what goes around comes around. And this is, this is a, this is a long time truth in human existence. And, and eventually maybe that catches up with them. Uh, their aging population problem, you know, they have these like ghost cities, just, mm -hmm. you know, that are just mm -hmm. built for nothing. I mean, it doesn't, you know, to an extent, it doesn't seem sustainable. Um, but so what are the best arguments there? Sure. So the best arguments, I mean, you, you outlined a few of them. Um, other ones, of course, the, the religious persecution, Falun Gong, House Christians, um, obviously the Uyghur situation. Um, you know, do you get, and remember the reason that so many Uyghurs went, so that they, they constantly bring up the fact when they use the justification for these concentration camps, um, the fact that there were Uyghurs that went and fought with the Taliban in Afghanistan, which is right across the border uh, from Kashgar. And so, but the, you know, the kind of the reason, reasoning, I guess, for the Uyghurs was, well, if we go and join and fight with the Taliban, then if the Taliban comes to power, they'll come and, and help fight for our freedom. This was sort of the idea. But of course, the Taliban, as we've seen, has not, has not reciprocated this at all. Yeah. And they said, you know, they're looking at China as saying, well, you know, this, the same deal that you're seeing from, from Ray Dalio and, and everybody else at BlackRock that, hey, these guys have money. They're going to be the power in Central Asia. Yeah. You know, why wouldn't we work with them? Um, so the question is, you know, could the Uyghurs, you know, rise up or do something like that? And then if you, um, probably the biggest one though, also that I see when I see China is this idea that, uh, these, these middle provinces though. So this, if you're talking about, look, when you have a couple percentages of unemployment here in the United States, and we just went through that with these lockdowns, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we were able to subsidize ourselves and, and get through that. Now we may be, um, having to pay the piper on that very soon here, and you're probably going to see a big crunch. You're already seeing that in the tech sector with because you know people got the money, they went right to the blue chat, you know, the blue stocks or blue chips, and uh, that's coming to a head. That's why Mark Zuckerberg is coming out all red eyed at these, uh, you know, at these investor um, uh, conferences that we're hearing. But you know, if you do that, in Ch the scale doesn't work in China, right? If you have that much unemployment, you tick up five percent, you've got tens of millions of people. Right that are just completely out of work. And so this was why I think that it's to Xi Jinping, it's such a big deal for him to continue, as you said, the ghost cities, but it's even just make work projects, right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, cities where, even when I was in Shanghai, I remember, you know, we, had, we worked in a, in a tower in, in downtown and it would get painted like twice a month. <laughs> the whole tower, just, you know, for no reason. Like right? the Navy. 
Yeah, it just, <laughs> it's like being in the Navy. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> Hayes grain underway. You know, need that bright work done again, you yeah. know. And, um, but it's, right, it's it's just total make work, and it, it, yeah. it makes no sense whatsoever. And, you know, Thomas Old had this great line about, um, you know, it's like uh, uh, taking water from the deep end and putting it into the shallow end and think that you're going right. to fill, you know, fill your pool. And that works if someone from outside is dumping, you know, more water and more money in. But if he doesn't have that leverage coming in anymore, what is he going to do with this massive population? Now, they are hitting a population cliff, but it's also going to be a worker cliff for them yeah. in terms of this, in terms of age, because the one child policy was in place for 35 years. Yeah. Um, and you had, so you have this whole gen, and by the way, you have this whole generation right now where it's kind of like, uh, kind of like New York in the 80s. Like, how do I make money? How can I get rich? How can I, you know, do all this? Like, they're not, it, some people, yeah, sure, you've got, you know, your nationalists over there. I want to do this for the glory of China. And they talk about, um, right. but do you, you know, think there is this sort of rebirth of individual liberty, cultural identity, that do you think that's what that is? Or do you think it can at least lead to that? You think greed can lead I to think that? It's, I think it's more like Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. I think it's more like, how do I make money? And then the party understands this, right? And they've, they've been the ones that have inculcated it. So that's why you're starting to see the party now kind of put, kind of pump the brakes on some of this, right? We're saying that, you know, uh, Jack Ma obviously is, is the biggest example of saying, you know, don't get too big for your britches. Yeah. We're not going to allow these private bank accounts like he was trying to push, which is what they went after him for, which Charlie Munger um, said he thought was great to take out a guy who's trying to create his own banking system. Um, and then, so they are trying to curb that. And they, th I think that they are potentially worried about it going in that direction of having anyone who could have the ability to seriously threaten the party. But the way the party works, it's it's very insidious in the sense that, you know, if you're out there, if you're, you know, running an engineering firm or running an investment firm, or you're just doing something you know, that they've allowed to to build up, what they do is they then they approach you and they see you're, you know, kind of like on your way up and they say, hey, you know, you've reached a certain point in your career, we're going to offer you membership to the party. And then so this is how they're able to essentially co-opt everybody on the way up, because if you say no, you, you're done, right? If you say no, that's it's because it's a double-edged sword, right? If right. you say yes, you're opening the door to the rest of your life. You run it like a mob. Yes, very much so. I mean, and, and, you know, the question will, be, will always be, is that sustainable? And, and I don't think we know the answer to that. But I guess so the next question is, how can the United States, now that, we, I, I, and I think we've had an awakening at this point in our country. Again, the Democrat Party is, is, is lagging behind a little bit on this. But there's certainly an awakening that le at least we know that they are, they are, this is not some peaceful rise. Okay, this is this is made in China 2025. This is the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, Xi Jinping does have these these, these grand visions for what China will be, um, and, uh, in the in the near term at least a regional hegemon, but potentially global in the future. So, what is the what is the U.S. strategy, and what do we need to do? What should we be thinking about in Congress um, to to hit that strategy? Again, I, I mentioned the Competes Act. Um, Perhaps well intentioned, but it was unclear to me what they were going to do. It was basically a bunch of grant money, a lot of corporate buyouts, or, or you know, buying off corporations, a lot of cronyism. It's unclear to me how the government creates supply chains, um, but that was that was basically what the purpose of the granting was for. So, well, and know, it's also not, so that that you know anyone who voted for it can go back to their constituents and right, say, look, right. see, I just voted to to build a supply chain, but those. Darn Republicans. And, yeah. You know, yeah. We would have had a supply chain, but it's like, what does that even mean? How do I just create a supply chain? Supply right. chains are complex. I mean, this, this, this is, look, it took us 20 years to get here. Right. And, and it's, it's, you're not going to, it's like turning an aircraft carrier, right? You're not going to be able to do that on a dime. And this is a situation though. I think that as a country, we're now starting to understand that we do need to reinvest in our country this way. Um, the hollowing out of America was done by policy, and we can have a rebuilding of America by that policy. But at the same time, an America that is um, looking to restore those supply chains, restore our manufacturing base, looking at these industries that, hey, yes, these are national security interests. We just saw that when it, even, you know, if you had come to me three years ago and said that, uh, you know, face masks would be a security situation that we need to be able to manufacture those. Well, it turned out, you know, that was right. This did become an issue because now we had to go to them. And uh, certainly when it comes to steel, this is the obvious, you know, the obvious industry that we need to bring back. And so I think as a country, number one is finding ways to redirect that financial flow. And I know as conservatives, that's not 
something that we want to talk about is all free flow of capital and, and people and you know, borders, et cetera. That's, that's the goal. But the problem is, you know, not everybody around the world is, is agreeing with that, right? You know, they view it as zero sum game, whereas, you know, we're thinking we can have this end of history. And so, you know, really looking at ways to redirect that back into the United States. Um, I'm seeing some great stuff now, VC, and we haven't really talked Taiwan, but, um, you know, Taiwan's greatest comparative advantage is semiconductors, and they are Silicon Valley West. You're now seeing Taiwanese companies being um, making deals in the United States. Uh, Phoenix, there's one. There are some that are going up in the um, in the Wisconsin area that are coming back around in terms of actually building uh, fabricator plants yeah. inside the, the United Intel States. Just announced a couple plants in Ohio. I think. Ohio, right? So you are you're kind of seeing it so around it the edges naturally as as the private sector is seeing instability in the Pacific. In well, and that's something where you know you you come in and you say, look, you know. What can we, you know, you go to private sector and say, what can we do to support this? Because we want more of this. Is, and is that a tax credit? Mm -hmm. Is it is it just a line of credit? Is it, you know, right. f, you know, a couple of years tax free that we're able to, you know, allow these incubators to come in? When China was growing, I mean, some funny enough, you know, we take a look at how China did this. They instituted uh, free trade zones. They instituted uh, special economic regions because when Deng Xiaoping was still was first. You know, moving away from you know sort of your your full on Chairman Mao you know communism to this to what he called market Leninism, mm -hmm. he instituted these areas as incubators for these new types of projects, and then used because you know China is a large country, the obviously massive population, so it, you know provincially he's able to do what we're able to do in special regions as well, and I think that makes sense. He says we can do things on even a state by state basis or in certain regions of the United States where which you know which lend themselves to these various industries where we say you know. Let's let's come up with a tax policy for this area that makes sense. You know, if it's going to be Phoenix and semiconductors, great. Let's do it. Used to be, you know, the semiconductor industry started in. That's why they call it Silicon Valley, right? That's actually where the name comes from. But it obviously and, is left and states, there. of course, do that. I mean, they out compete each other for sure. tax breaks. If you, if you open up a plant here, um, seems to me when I, when I because when I talk to, to industries about you know, what it would take, you know, is it, is it tariffs? Do we just do we just put a carbon tax on Chinese goods? Because um, I'm really not for a carbon tax on our own stuff, uh, which a lot of people want. You'd think Greta but, would be all for that, yeah, right? You know, think, let's you know, but, let's but, but but in the middle. Say no, it, it doesn't help us compete. Um, it just raises the costs of, of supplies that we need to build our things because supply chains. And are this is complex. right. This so this is the catch twenty two. So that's the catch twenty two of it because the supply chains already exist from China, mm -hmm. and so if you're putting tariffs on, then even if you're trying to. to build in the United States, all of your precursors are coming from, you know, auto parts, right? They're coming from China now. And so this is, this is something where I, I'm telling people it's, it's, it's a 20 year process. You know, this, there isn't yeah. one magic bullet quick fix to any of this, but I, I love that. Look, I, I was the guy, you know, in the back of the room saying, Hey, we should do something about China 15 years ago. And they're like, okay, you know, IS2 Pasobic, you know, <laughs> we, you know, we think we know what we're doing. Like, no, I mean, I get that, but, you know, these they seem to be winning and, and they're militarizing yeah. these islands. And, uh, yeah. you know, they're you like, know? like well, well, we're going to put an we're going to put on an ASEAN declaration. I'm like, yeah, but that's fine. But, you know, they're not going to you know, pay attention to that at well, all. Let's talk military then for, for, for yeah. a quick minute then. So um, what should we be investing in uh, to counter what they've invested in? I mean, they've basically invested in weapons, air to air missiles, um, these hypersonics that that are just deliberately designed to screw with us so that we can't really fight a war. Um, the the main thing that the United States has been completely lagging behind the uh, the PRC, the PLA on is offensive cyber and um, really just a AI and the military implications of AI, which go hand in hand with offensive cyber. Um, they they view offensive cyber in a way where they say, you know, hey, maybe we can't take out, you know. Maybe we don't need to take out an aircraft carrier's ability to launch planes, but if we can shut off, you know, if we can mess around with their nuclear reactor, then they can't move the ship, so we can't get it into range so they can do anything. Or if we go to a destroyer, you know, we might not be able to get into their missile systems or the VLS, but we may but we might be able to shut off their, you know, their engine, right? Now you're dead in the water. So that that's how they're looking at this. And of course our systems aren't set up or haven't been set up to, you know, prevent that type of, of uh cyber intrusion. So I think the more we that we look at offensive cyber from that perspective, um, that I think we will be very much more able to meet them where they're coming at us. And then also, uh, 
you know, that goes hand in hand with uh, disinformation systems, being able to break into their comms and just really screw around with them, be able to send people all over the place, you know, change their ship directions, all that. Um, when it comes to, you know, when it, and, and, you know, um, you know, obviously have my issues with the NSA in terms of what some of the things that they've done over the past few years, but I, I do think that they're the best at this in terms of, certainly in terms of code cracking, look, the guys up there at the fort are the best in the world at this, but I think you need to unleash them when it comes to offensive cyber. Yeah. And, um, we ask those questions, but we don't get a lot of answers and probably for good reason. So we don't want those capabilities out there, but, um, I would agree with that because it's, it does seem obvious now that in future, in, in, in the future, an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea is a, is a giant target. Yeah. Um, even our even our aircraft right now are just targets. Uh, they they can reach further out and they have they have a deeper magazine than we do because we're in their backyard. And, and it should be said when 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 the Air Force when everybody got freaked out because the Air Force did a a um, you know a scenario where we were at war with China and we lost. To, to keep in mind that was over there. That was while fighting over there. It's not like China could just invade the United States and we'd all be screwed. So you know, it's important that people know that they should right, feel right. a little good. That, that being said, if you if you live in Okinawa or Guam, yeah, it's yeah, not, good. not 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 a good scenario for you. When you look at Russia and everyone in D.C. is talking about Russia's relationship with China right now, and they're saying, "Look at this! This is an alliance," and they've. They've met, you know, together at the Olympics. This has been their biggest. And and she's holding a series of meetings with Central Eastern European powers, uh, Singapore, Argentina, just signed into the BRI yesterday. Mm. Um, so, you know, literally in our backyard, um, signs into BRI. And when you look at Russia and China, their relationship on paper, or if you're just looking at the headlines, you say, oh, these guys are driving, you know, into each other's arms and it makes sense. But when you look at each of their geostrategic um, goals as countries and just the geography of it, really, you, there's a lot of areas of, of rivalry as well. So mm-hmm. when you look at the Middle East, like they're clear rivals in the Middle East. When you look at Central Asia, you know, who has dominance over Central Asia, the heartland theory, which was the core of the Cold War, right, mm-hmm. uh, question. So places like Kazakhstan, places like uh, Kyrgyzstan, et cetera, right, you know, who actually has dominance there, Afghanistan. Um, or even places like the Russian Far East, like Siberia. So, you know, obviously China wants Siberia. They would, the, the hyper-nationalists talk about getting back Vla, uh, Vladivostok, right? Because people don't remember that hmm. the Qing Dynasty's borders were not the same as, as the currently constituted Chinese borders. And uh, so the city that is now Vladivostok at the time was this Manchurian sort of mm-hmm. settlement. And so they are building, pi- there is a pipeline that goes from there to, to Beijing right now. There's an oil pipeline that they're talking about building across all the way from Western Russia across Mongolia into uh, into China. Of course, Russia's greatest advantage is their their oil reserves. They're using them for as much political leverage as possible. But you do see rivalries there, and I think there's a real reason that you haven't seen a major military alliance be signed between Russia and China right now. Because I think Russia understands that if they were to do that, they would be junior partner very fast, mm. and China would be able to start dictating to them terms. Right? You know do want this territory back or we want, you know, special uh, access to these oil reserves. And so I think Russia kind of realizes that they don't, you know, they need a relationship, but they don't want to be fully in on the relationship, which is kind of similar to Washington when you look at it that way. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, back, back, back to the original <laughs> question though about Taiwan is what can we do better now uh, that would p- potentially prevent fix the navy the, the fix the navy i mean is, is, you got to make taiwan a porcupine and i guess the question is how i mean i've heard complaints from the dod that taiwanese just don't buy the stuff that they should be buying from us mm-hmm. they have the option but they don't buy it um you know they they buy fancy looking things um which is you know, ha- ha- having been deployed out there to create like this is this is I, a cultural uh, problem I, they want to buy fancy things instead of things that work something i well i can't talk about in too much detail but you know us you know going to train on a system that they had purchased from us and then going back, you know, a year later to conduct the second training and realizing that the equipment was still in the same spot that mm-hmm. we had left it the last time we were there kind of thing right. in Taiwan. And so, um, you know, I think, I think when it comes to Taiwan, you know, making it, making it a poison pill, right. So, you know, we don't make it harder for them to be able to purchase it or, or, or take it, obviously invade it. Um, but really when I, I think it comes to Taiwan at the end of the day, China's policy, mainland China's policy, has been assimilation, right? Isolation and assimilation. So isolate from the global power, global world, but then also assimilate to 
a generational kind of takeover, right? Mm -hmm. Just and just take it through osmosis. So I don't know if this is the the Western conception of they are just going to invade and take it over, unless unless you know you really saw Xi Jinping or or the party in some huge regime collapse scenario where he needs to restore legitimacy. Yeah. Otherwise, at the end of the day, I think it it does also still go back to those economic ties. Increase our economic ties with Taiwan. Increase obviously, you know, we're going to need semiconductors. We're going to be driving Ford F two fifties, etc. Right, mm -hmm. we've, we've got chips and everything now. So as the more we increase that the better off Taiwan situation is for us okay well that, that's a hopeful that's a hopeful answer <laughs> um, and well what do you think is gonna happen in Ukraine you might have a different opinion on that than that you clearly do than say the administration the administration think thinks it's imminent so you know it's funny is is you know as I was kind of digging into the Vladivostok stuff a minute um, recently and and the way that Russia actually was able to get that treaty to get Vladivostok or the area that Vladivostok is now in the Russian Far East was that they amassed troops on China's border mm -hmm. and they said they they threatened to invade unless China signed something over, which which the Qing Dynasty later did because mm -hmm. they, they had just lost the Opium War and they were in no position to uh, make any demands. And I said, well, isn't that kind of interesting? You know, similar to what Russia is doing now. So it's it's you know achieving diplomatic and in that case territorial. Uh, claims without actually having to fire a shot. And I said, I wonder, because I mean, look, the, the Kremlin has a blob and a foreign policy establishment the same way the United States does. They view the United States mm -hmm. as their greatest enemy. They view our missile sites in Romania and Poland as existential threats to them. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's interesting to me, though, is that, you know, is this something in their doctrine that they've clearly used before? I think I think they want concessions. I think yeah. they want, just, you know. They've built some leverage up and right. they're, they're going to use it. They were, they're going to see whatever deal they can get. And whether that's, you know, for the entire Donbass region or diplomatic recognition for Crimea and the separatist controlled areas of Donetsk, you know, we'll see. But that being said, I think when I see that, like you said, the giant table with uh, with Putin and Macron, I think that's him saying, make me a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's also a hopeful outlook. <laughs> um, I think it's in their it, interest. I don't yeah. I don't think. No, that, it's, a, it's a completely it, rational, rational to, analysis. I don't think that going to war. Is, is in their national interest right. at all. I think it would be, they'd be expended very quickly, certainly going to war with, with, with NATO, you know, Article 5, right. and, you know, and having family that are, you know, from that region. Uh, you know, nobody wants more, or nobody wants war less than people that live in Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't mean hopeful as a naive. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a, certainly a potential outcome. Uh, Jack, we're basically out of time, um, and I think I got to go vote. But uh, thanks for coming on. This has been this really has been very it. good and informative uh, on a pretty hot topic right now. So thanks. Cheers, <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it, Congressman. All right, we did it. <laughs>